friends, I am Tahseen Khan, Assistant Professor, Sagar. Dear friends, today we are going to discuss about an interesting and learning episode from one of the important unit of Immunology and Immunological Preparations 3 of subject Pharmaceutical Microbiology, B Farm 8th semester, which is scripted by Dr. Rupal Dubey, Assistant Professor, Guest Faculty, Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Dr. Hari Singhor, Central University, Sagar, Madhya Pradesh. The goal of this episode is to elucidate the characteristics of a healthy immune system, focusing on the principles of hypersensitivity, active and passive immunization products, their preparations, standardization and storage. Let's start our episode while taking a look at what we are going to discuss further. There will be five modules in which module number one consists of introduction to hypersensitivity, module number two types of hypersensitivity, module number three immunizing agents, module number four preparations and standardization of immunizing agents and module number five storage and handling of immunizing agents. The module number one is introduction to hypersensitivity. An active immune system is vital for protecting us from deadly infections and when it fails, for example, in congenital immunodeficiencies or advanced HIV infection. Individuals become very susceptible to infections and may not survive unless treated. On the other hand, immune responses themselves can become harmful. There are three main situations in which immune responses are pathologic. Number one, when self-tolerance fails and the immune system begins to attack an individual's own tissues that is causing autoimmune diseases. Number two, when the immune response becomes excessive or uncontrolled either against microbial antigens or against normally harmless environmental antigens. Number three, as part of an entirely normal reaction against some microbes, you will come across diseases caused by all these reactions as you go through your education and will hear about various such diseases in organs. In this lecture, we will introduce you to some of the basic principles of tissue injury caused by immune responses, hypersensitivity and autoimmunity. Disorders caused by pathologic immune responses are called hypersensitivity diseases. This term is derived from the idea that an individual who has previously encountered an antigen is sensitive to a second encounter with that antigen, that is, mount a stronger response upon the second encounter. Hypersensitivity denotes an abnormal or pathologic reaction. There are four types of hypersensitivity which differ in their pathogenesis, effector mechanisms and clinical and pathologic manifestations that is described in the table number one. We will describe each of these in more detail later. Table number one describes the types of hypersensitivity diseases. It is preferable to use the descriptive terms rather than the less informative numerical classifications. The next is autoimmunity. Autoimmunity refers to immune responses against self-antigens. When autoimmunity develops, antibodies and or T-cells begin to react against self-antigens and to attack the tissues where these antigens are located. These reactions are examples of hypersensitivity. In other words, autoimmunity is one cause of hypersensitivity. Note, however that hypersensitivity reactions can also be triggered by foreign or microbial or environmental antigens. So, the terms hypersensitivity and autoimmunity are not synonymous. A common clinical and pathological manifestations of immunological diseases is inflammation, especially chronic inflammation. Inflammation is a vascular and cellular reaction to a wide variety of injurious and dangerous stimuli. We will discuss the causes and consequences of inflammation and how leukocytes destroy microbes as well as host tissues in later lectures. 
Many types of inflammation are caused by abnormal immune responses, that is, hypersensitivity. A modern name for diseases that are caused by abnormal immune responses, example, against self-antigens and in which inflammation is an important component is immune-mediated inflammatory diseases because of the prominent role that abnormal immune responses play in many common inflammatory diseases. An introduction to immunology is important as a prelude to subsequent courses in which these disorders will be described in much more detail. Before discussing the mechanism of tissue injury in hypersensitivity diseases, we will touch upon the situations in which immune responses against self or foreign antigens might become the cause of diseases. Autoimmunity Why self-tolerance fails? The normal immune system does not react against self-antigens. During the generation of a large number of specificities, all individuals produce lymphocytes that is T and B, whose antigen receptors can recognize self-antigens. If these lymphocytes encounter self-antigens during their maturation, that is, in the bone marrow and thymus, the self-reactive lymphocytes are killed. Even if some self-reactive lymphocytes complete their maturation, their encounter with the self-antigen in peripheral tissues results in the death of permanent inactivation of the lymphocytes. Thus, the collection of lymphocytes in healthy individuals is purged of cell capable of reacting against self. However, in some individuals, self-tolerance fails and T and or B lymphocytes specific for self-antigens survive, become activated and the cells or their products that is antibodies attack the tissues in which those antigens are present. Although we are beginning to understand the mechanism of self-tolerance based largely on animal experiments, we do not know why self-tolerance fails in any human autoimmune diseases. Likely, underlying mechanisms include the inheritance of susceptibility genes, infections and other causes of tissue injury which leading to release of self-antigen and activation of specific lymphocytes. Presents in our figure number 1. This is similar to the pathogenesis of most multifactorial diseases which involve some combinations of susceptibility genes and environmental triggers. Disorders caused by immune responses against foreign antigens. Some immunological diseases are the result of poorly controlled responses to foreign antigens. In other diseases, these responses are quite normal and tissue injury is an unfortunate accompaniment. Examples include the following in allergic disease that is intermediate hypersensitivity. Genetically susceptible individuals make strong Th2 responses to environmental antigens. Pollen, foods, insect, proteins, some drugs and so on that are well tolerated in most individuals. Examples include asthma, that is, organs block. Sometimes, large amounts of antibodies are produced in response to a microbe and the microbial antigen is persistent, resulting in the formation of antigen-antibody complexes, as in post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, discussed in organs. In other situations, antibodies produced against a microbe happen to bind to, cross-react with, a self-antigen and therefore attack the individual's own tissues, that is rheumatic fever, also organs. In some cases, the immune system reacts strongly against bacteria that are normal inhabitants of our GI tract, which is called as commensals. Crohn's disease, MNN is thought to be an example of one such disease. Some microbes are difficult to eradicate and elicit strong T-cells responses and chronic inflammation with large number of activated macrophages. The macrophages produce substances intended to kill the microbes, but these same substances damage normal tissues. In some cases, the immune response is entirely normal, but 
results in damage of host cells. For instance, is the hepatitis virus is not cytopathic when it infects liver cells host. CTLS are activated and they kill infected cells in an attempt to eradicate the infection. Even though the virus itself may be quite harmless, thus viral hepatitis is initiated by the virus but liver damage is a result of a normal host response that is trying to get rid of the virus. M and N. Now that we have reviewed the main conditions that lead to disease producing immune responses. We will conclude by describing how these responses actually result in tissue injury. A general principle that is important to remember is that the effective mechanism of tissue injury in immunological diseases are the same as the effective mechanism used by the immune system to combat and destroy microbes. Dear friends, moving to our next module, module number 2, types of hypersensitivity. Number 1, immediate that is type 1 hypersensitivity. TH2 mediated diseases, these disorders are characterized by abnormally strong TH2 responses against environmental antigens that are essentially ignored by the 75 to 80 percent of the population that does not suffer from allergies. All the clinical and pathological manifestations of allergy are the results of cytokines produced by Th2 cells which is illustrated in a figure number 2. IL-4 stimulates B cells specific for the antigen to produce IgE antibody which then binds to mast cells. When the antigen binds to the antibody, it activates mast cells to release many mediators such as histamine protease and cytokines that cause the acute vascular and smooth muscles reaction and inflammation that are typical of allergies. IL-5 made by the Th2 cells activates eosinophils, which can exacerbate tissue damage. Th2 cells also secrete IL-13 which acts on mucosal epithelial cells to stimulate secretion of mucus. Bronchial asthma is a Th2 mediated disease about which you will hear more in organs block. The propensity to develop allergies is genetic but the actual genes that may be causative have not been definitely identified. Number 2. How antibodies damage tissues Type 2 and 3 hypersensitivity. Antibodies other than IgE can cause severe tissue injury. In some cases, antibodies may be produced against cell or tissue antigens and may deposit on cells or in the tissues. That is antibody mediated or type 2 hypersensitivity. Usually these are autoantibodies and their production reflects a failure of self tolerance. In other cases, antibodies against self-antigens or microbial antigens may form immune complexes if the antigen are present in the circulation. And these complexes may deposit in vascular walls, that is immune complex mediated or type 3 sensitivity. Once antibodies are deposited, they activate several mechanisms that result in tissue damage and inflammation, which is illustrated in a figure number 3. The tail of the antibody activates a series of plasma proteins that make up the complement system. The complement system is a collection of plasma proteins that are activated by microbes or by antibodies bound to microbes and tissue antigens and are deposited on these surfaces. Various products of complement bring in leukocytes that is inflammation are recognized by phagocytes resulting in phagocytosis of coated cells and promote death of cells on which complement proteins are deposited. The tail of the antibody called the FCPs because this fragment has a propensity to crystallize in solution is also recognized by FC receptors on phagocytes, macrophages and neutrophils. Once these pathways are activated they cause disease in several ways, which can be seen in a figure number 4. A. 
If the antibody is deposited on a cell, example erythrocyte or platelet, the combined action of complement and FC receptors result in that cell being eaten and destroyed by phagocytes. This is the basis of red blood cells and platelets depletion in autoimmune hemolytic anemia and thrombocytopenia respectively. B. If the antibody is deposited on a solid surface, the phagocytes may be activated and release toxic substances that induce inflammation and damage the tissue, as in some forms of glomerulonephritis. C. Less commonly, antibodies can cause disease by interfering with normal molecules, such as hormones and hormone receptors, without any actual tissue injury. Examples include Mycenthenia gravis, BMB, and Graves' disease, M and N. Number 3. How T lymphocytes damage tissues, which is a type 4 hypersensitivity. T lymphocytes injure tissues by two principal mechanisms, which can be seen in a figure number 4. Number 1 is CD4 plus T lymphocytes of the Th1 subset produce cytokines that activate macrophages mainly IFN and recruit inflammatory cell TNF. TH17 cells secrete cytokines that also results leukocytes such as neutrophils and may thus be major contributor to inflammation in T cell mediated hypersensitivity disorders. These reactions are called delay type sensitivity because they take 24 to 48 hours T develop after antigen challenge. The classical example is a PPD skin test that is Th1 and or Th17 reactions against self antigens or against persistent microbes are responsible for many chronic disorders that you will hear about Crohn's disease type 1 diabetes, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis. Number 2, CD8 plus CTLS directly kill host cells as in viral hepatitis which is mentioned above. CTL mediated cell injury may also contribute to some Th1 mediated diseases such as type 1 diabetes. Recent remarkable successes in treating these diseases are based largely on improved understanding of the underlying immune abnormalities and the role of lymphocytes and cytokines in the pathogenesis of these diseases. Such successes have fueled tremendous interest in studying immune-mediated inflammatory diseases and in developing new therapeutic strategies. Dear friends, here we come to our next module, module number 3, that is immunizing agents. Immunizing agents are classified as passive or active. Number one is passive immunizing agents. The prevention of illness through the transfer of preformed IgG antibodies is called immunoprophylaxis, while the protection is immediate. It is temporary and it can only be offered if the exposure is recognized. Protection is also time sensitive. Post-exposure immunoprophylaxis must be initiated within a short time frame, usually within days of exposure to the infection. Passive agents may not be completely free of blood-borne pathogens despite all current safeguards and technology in place. Now types of passive immunizing agents are standard immune globulin pooled antibody from thousands of donors. It is now primarily used for post-exposure prophylaxis against measles. Hyperimmune globulins made from donated plasma of persons with high levels of a specific Ig. Example, hepatitis B immune globulin. Hyperimmune serum produced in animals. Example, botulinum and diphtheria and detoxins. Here the table number 2. Passive immunizing agents. Number two is active immunizing agents. Protection acquired 
through active immunizing agents is produced by one's own immune response. Protection takes longer than with passive immunizing agents but is stronger and may be permanent. Here is a table number 3 which represents the active immunizing agents. Now the third is replicating vaccines, live attenuated vaccines. These vaccines contain whole living virus or bacteria that induce immunity by actively replicating within the host. Attenuated means the vaccine strains are weakened so that infection is usually unapparent or very mild because these vaccines replicate the immune responses is both cell mediated and humoral and therefore protection is long lasting, probably lifelong. Now the limitations are circulating antibodies can interfere with vaccine virus replication. Sensitive to exposure to heat and light. Use with caution contraindicated in immunocompromised persons. Live vaccines must be given on the same day or 20th 8 days apart because circulating interferons may interfere with the replication of the second live vaccines. Number 4 is non-replicating vaccines because these vaccines do not replicate. Protection takes longer to achieve as more vaccines doses are needed to create a protective immune response. After scheduled numbers of vaccine doses are given, the immune response is strong and may be permanent. With some vaccines, antibody levels may fall over time and as a result, booster doses may be needed. In activated vaccines, which is presented in a figure number 5, so in activated vaccines contain killed bacteria or viruses. Subunit vaccines, subunit vaccines contain purified products that usually come from the bacteria or virus that causes natural infection but may also be synthesized in the laboratory using recombinant technology. Proteins purified inactivated proteins from the outer coating of viruses and bacteria. Aluminium salt is added as an adjuvant to the enhance the immune response. Protein toxoid vaccine made from inactivated bacterial toxins. Aluminium salt is added as an adjuvant to enhance the immune response. Here is a figure number 5 which represents the inactivated vaccines. Recombinant vaccines. Vaccines antigens produced using genetic engineering technology. Polysaccharides vaccines. Polysaccharide vaccines are composed of long chains of sugar molecules that make up the surface capsules of encapsulated bacteria. The immune response to a pure polysaccharide vaccine is typically T-cell independent. Conjugate vaccines By linking a polysaccharide to a protein, diphtheria toxoid protein is commonly used. The immune response becomes T-cells dependent and immunogenicity is improved in infants and young children lesser than 2 years of age. This process is called conjugation, hence term conjugate vaccines. Here we come to our module number 4, which represents preparation and standardization of immunizing agent. Two workers make openings in chicken eggs in preparation for production of measles vaccines. Production of vaccines. Vaccines production has several stages. First, the antigen itself is generated. Viruses are grown either on primary cells such as chicken eggs, example for influenza, or on continuous cell lines such as cultured human cells, example for hepatitis A. Bacteria are grown in bioreactors, example Haemophilus influenza type B. Likewise, a recombinant protein derived from the viruses or bacteria can be generated in yeast bacteria or cell cultures. After the antigen is generated, it is isolated from the cells used to generate it. A virus may need to be inactivated, possibly with no further purification required. Recombinant proteins 
need many operations involving ultrafiltration and column chromatography. Finally, the vaccine is formulated by adding adjuvant, stabilizers and preservatives as needed. The adjuvant enhances the immune response of the antigen stabilizers, increases the storage life and preservatives allow the use of multi-dose vials. Combination vaccines are harder to develop and produce because of potential incompatibilities and interactions among the antigens and other ingredients involved. Vaccines production techniques are involving. Cultured mammalian cells are expected to become increasingly important compared to conventional options such as chicken eggs due to greater productivity and low incidence of problems with contamination. Now recombination technology that produce genetically detoxified vaccine is expected to grow in popularity for the production of bacterial vaccines that use toxoids. Combination vaccines are expected to reduce the quantities of antigen they contain and thereby decreases undesirable interactions by using pathogen associated molecular patterns. In 2010, India produced 60% of the world's vaccines worth about $900 million or about 670 million pounds. Excipients besides the active vaccines itself, the following excipients and residual manufacturing compounds are present or may be present in vaccine preparation. Aluminium salts or gels are added as adjuvants. Adjuvants are added to promote an earlier, more potent response and more persistent immune response to a vaccines. They allow for a lower vaccine dosage. Now, antibiotics are added to some vaccines to prevent the growth of bacteria during production and storage of the vaccine. Egg protein is present in influenza and yellow fever vaccines as they are prepared using chicken eggs. Other proteins may be present. Now, formaldehyde is used to inactivate bacterial products for toxoid vaccines. Formaldehyde is also used to inactivate unwanted viruses and kill bacteria that might contaminate the vaccine during production. Monosodium glutamate that is MSG and 2-phenoxyethanol are used as stabilizers in a few vaccines to help the vaccine remain unchanged when the vaccine is exposed to heat, light, acidity or humidity. Thimerosal is a mercury containing antimicrobial that is added to vials of vaccine that contain more than one dose to prevent contamination and growth of potentially harmful bacteria. Due to the conversely surrounding thimerosal, it has been removed from most vaccines except multi-use influenza where it was reduced to levels so that a single dose contained less than one microgram of mercury. A level similar to eating 10 gram of canned tuna. Role of preservatives. Many vaccines need preservatives to prevent serious adverse effects such as Staphylococcus infection, which in one 1928 incident killed 12 of 21 children inoculated with a diphtheria vaccine that lacked a preservatives. Several preservatives are available including thimerosal, phenoxyethanol and formaldehyde. Thiomersal is more effective against bacteria, has a better shelf life and improves vaccine stability, potency and safety. But in the US, the European Union and a few other affluent countries, it has no longer used as a preservative in childhood vaccines. As a precautionary measure due to its mercury content, Although controversial claims have been made that thiomersal contributes to autism, no convincing scientific evidence supports these claims. Standardization of vaccines, toxins, toxoid vaccines and sera cannot as yet be identified chemically with sufficient precision to permit a statement. In gram units of the fraction of pure substance contained in a preparation. Standardization tries to cope 
with this situation by introducing another unitage system based on the specific biological activity of a given weight of an admittedly impure standard operations. Keeping in view the global concept of standards, there is a need for regular review of the uses of vaccines. The updating of the information should be related to following parameters in accordance with WHO guidelines. First is product specific standards and assays. Second, assignment of unitage international units. Third, collaborative studies, suitability of the standards for their intended use. Number four, continuous improvements of the assays and comparability studies. Here is a figure number six that is standardization of vaccines, vaccines characterization. Setting standards for monitoring consistency of vaccines production are described in the following points. Number one is preclinical evaluation. It distinguishes most promising candidates on the basis of quantifiable parameters. Example, immunogenicity. Number two is clinical evaluation. The comparison of different vaccine formulation is carried out in terms of protective efficacy and or safety. Number three is lot release. The specifications on a lot to lot basis are defined. Principles for biological standardization. The reference standard should be assigned a value in arbitrary rather than absolute units and the expectations need to be justified. Where well, the number one is the unit is defined by a reference standard with a physical existence. Number two, in the establishment of the standard, a variety of methods are used. The value is assigned to the standard. Therefore, the definition of the unit is not necessarily dependent on a specific method of determination. Number three is the behavior of the reference standard should resemble as closely as possible the behavior of test sample in the assay systems to test them. Here is a figure number seven, the prerequisite for development of vaccines and approach for their standardization. Dear friends, coming to our next module, which is the last module, module number five, storage and handling of immunizing agent. Immunizing agent are biological materials that are subject to gradual loss of potency over time. So loss of potency can be accelerated under certain conditions of storage, handling and transport. The effects of exposure to adverse environmental conditions such as freezing, heat and light, MMR and varicella vaccines are cumulative. The loss of potency may result in failure to stimulate and adequate immunologic response, leading to lower levels of protection against disease. Cold chain. The cold chain refers to the process used to maintain optimal conditions during the transport, storage and handling of vaccines. It is maintained through the use of appropriate equipment and the adherence to correct procedures for storage, handling and transport of biological products. Vaccines are sensitive biological products which may become less effective or even destroyed when exposed to temperatures outside the recommended range. Some vaccines experience an immediate loss of potency following freezing. Vaccines exposed to temperatures above the recommended temperature range experience loss of potency with each episode of exposure. The recommended temperature for refrigerated vaccines is plus 2 degrees centigrade to plus 8 degrees centigrade. Now the equipment, the following are necessary for cold chain maintenance. A. Vaccine cooler for immunization clinics. B. Refrigerator. Biological products need to be stored in a dedicated biological refrigerator such as laboratory, industrial grade or pharmacy refrigerator. Domestic frost free refrigerators. Bar fridges cannot be used because 
they do not maintain appropriate temperatures. Biological refrigerators cannot be used for food or beverages in order to avoid unnecessary door opening. The refrigerator needs to be locked or located in the room that can be locked. This will prevent unauthorized refrigerator tampering and product handling. The C1 is temperature monitoring device. These devices monitor the temperature in the refrigerator during clinics or when shipping vaccines. Thermometers having a dedicated refrigerator for biological products is not enough. You also need to monitor the refrigerator temperature to ensure it stays within the acceptable range. Record the minimum and maximum temperatures at the start and end of each workday and record on the vaccine's temperature log. Use one of the following type of thermometers to monitor the refrigerator temperature. A minimum or maximum thermometer. A. Constant temperature recording device. Vaccine's temperature log record the minimum and maximum temperature at the start and end of each workday on the following forms. Microsoft Office Excel 97 to 2003 worksheet. Number D is freezer. Necessary for freezing the ice packs. Handling of immunizing agents. Proper handling of immunizing agent is necessary to maintain the cold chain. A. General handling principles. Minimize vaccine handling. Return product to the refrigerator or cooler as quickly as possible. When not in use. Use a small cooler at the work station during clinics. Multi-dose vials print the date of opening and the label of a multi-dose vial. Use within 30 days of opening unless there are specific directions in the product insert for discarding sooner. Removed expired vaccines from the refrigerator and obtain authorization from public health before returning products. Reconstitute freeze-dried products immediately before administration. Opening the refrigerator door only when necessary and close it as soon as possible. B is a storage. Do not overcrowd vaccine in the refrigerator. Keep vaccines in original packing especially those needing protection from light. Never leave vaccines outside the refrigerator. Check and log temperature twice a day. Here is the figure number 8 which represents the vaccine's storage. C is inventory management. To ensure vaccines are used prior to their expiry dates and to reduce wastage. Use the following procedures. Order monthly and do not stock pile vaccine. Rotate vaccine stock according to expiry date. Placing those with the longest expiry date at the back. Check biological stock for expired products at the end of every month. Remove expired vaccines from the refrigerator. Send expired vaccines to the provincial bio depot in accordance with the BIMS, that is Business Procedures Manual. D. Unpacking vaccines. After delivery, unpack and refrigerate biological products immediately upon arrival. Check for evidence for physical damage. If cooler has a temperature indicator, device tamp tail 4. Check for the break in the cold chain. If there is evidence of damage or a break in the cold chain, quarantine vaccine in the refrigerator and consult with the public health biological products consultant for further instructions. Summary A state of immunity can be induced by passive or active immunization. Short term, passive immunization is induced by transfer of preformed antibodies. Infection or vaccination achieve long-term active immunization. Three types of vaccines are currently used in humans. Live attenuated, that is a virulent microorganisms. Inactivated, that is killed microorganisms or purified macromolecules. Protein components of pathogens expressed in cell culture 
may be effective vaccines. Polysaccharides vaccines may be conjugated to proteins to maximize immunogenicity. Recombinant vectors including viruses or bacteria engineered to carry genes from infectious microorganisms. Maximize cell mediated immunity to the encoded antigen. Plasmid DNA encoding protein antigen from a pathogen induces both humoral and cell mediated immunity. DNA vaccines for several diseases are in human clinical trials. Realizing the optimum benefits of vaccines will require cheaper manufacture and improved delivery methods for existing vaccines. Vaccines are sensitive biological products which may become less effective or even destroyed when exposed to temperatures outside the recommended range. Monitoring of the vaccine cold chain is required to ensure that biologics and being stored and transported at recommended temperatures. Should a break occur in the chain cold, the proper incident management process need to be followed. Thank you and goodbye.